all is well, and we are about to hop into what is effectively uh, the first ever episode of what is currently called Affairs of the State, and what I might end up calling Behead This Advisor, God knows, um, answers via a postcard. Uh, we have five of us on the show tonight to basically give you a live talk show of what might be the world's most unstreamable game. So it's going to be very entertaining to see how this actually shows up via Twitch. Um, before I get started, uh, welcome to everyone who is watching the stream and also a massive hello to uh, anyone who hasn't played before. Utopia-game.com is what we're going to be talking about this evening. What is possibly the world's oldest MMORPG, I'm sure someone will jump in and correct me if I'm wrong there, still text-based and still live into 2017 with what we think is a healthy and growing player base despite the times we live in. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, introduce everyone who you guys are going to be seeing on the stream tonight. I'm Joro, of course. Uh, some of you will know me as Jorosar elsewhere. I'm a player, but I predominantly do other stuff online um, in the esports arena. For those of you who don't play the game but might be following me from elsewhere, if so, hello! Uh, and we have four incredibly talented individuals who will be joining me from the realms of Utopia tonight. And we're going to go ahead and introduce everybody one by one so you know who they are. So I'm going to start off with David C. How are you? Who are you? And uh, what are you doing on the show this evening? I am doing very well. Thank you. I mean, you can expand on that. We will, we will let you introduce yourself as well. We're not moving. <laughs> uh, so I am from the Boston area, United States. I do a lot of um, property management. I'm into facilities management now during my, you know, times when I'm not playing Utopia or uh, things of the like. I have a young daughter she just started walking on monday so it's very exciting takes up a lot of my time and uh yeah just excited to be here and how do people from who already play utopia know you because not many people know david c yeah i'm you know i don't really consider myself very well known i played in brute force back in the early days and uh, once days. i stopped yeah, the good old days is right. When I stopped playing about age 30 or so, um, I came back. I Sometime in the mid-60s, I, I met um, Zopper, Jeff in uh, CR. I played an age in Expendables where I met Jeff and then played with Beast Blood a couple ages. And then I went back to CR. And, uh, you know, that's kind of how all of this began. So tempted to call that a mistake, but I promise not to. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Well, well, we'll let that slide for now. Great. And next up, of course, we have a Jeff or Jeff T or how, however you actually want us to call you. We're going to have to set that precedent now uh, in front of the live audience. But why don't you tell us who you are uh, in utopia terms as well as in the wider context of the game and as a gamer yourself and what you're doing on the show today? Sure. Uh, so I am Jeff, one of the owners of Utopia. I uh, came in with Dave uh, a couple of months ago when we bought the game from Sean and Brian. Um, I have played Utopia on and off pretty much since the start of Utopia. Um, I actually struggled to get into Utopia the first couple of times I tried it, but eventually around age 19 or 20, I founded a kingdom called Serenity, and Serenity played for... 10 to 15 ages, and then I played on and off again for another uh, five or six years, and then ultimately founded uh, Cromulent Republic, or CR, and uh, played more or less up until we bought the game. Nice. Wait, I'm confused. I thought Godly takes credit for everything CR-related. There's no way you could have founded it. Uh, well, I mean, I invited <laughs> Godly to the kingdom, so... Oh, cut the broadcast now! No one's allowed to know. <laughs> oh that's fantastic and it just occurred to me there's a chance i warred you in age 18 when serenity was first a thing but because uh, that would have been the first age i played um but that's a very long time ago and i played with a kingdom called ruthless who i think reformed this age actually but moving along uh we have as chat has correctly described mr steal your girl in the bottom left there just kind of lurking about with what looks like the perfect lighting and the professional backdrop 
and that absolutely I don't know how to describe it. He has an infectious smile. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the smiley face that you see on the forums so often. It's Bishop. Bishop, how are you doing? Uh, what's your involvement with the game been? And uh, kind of what's your history with the game? Oh, God. I started playing Tokyo back in the turn of the century, like, back in college. Um, started off in the industry. Then my first attack thought this game was stupid. Went away. Um, came back then and thought, actually, this is quite interesting. So I've been playing on uh, Utopia on the battlefields and World of Legends, back with Heretics. That was back in the mid I don't know, 20s, 30s, something like that. And then when um, when Joel took over, I got involved with the guys then, just helping me out volunteering. And then when Sean and Brian took over, I started working full time. Well, full time, started working properly with the game, doing game support and stuff like that. Um, my background is I'm a test manager, test software, um, in the West of Ireland. Nice. And do you still do that full time, like in parallel with your duties in Utopia? Yeah, yeah. my full time day job is, is software testing. Awesome. And then last but certainly not least, uh, we had a bit of a cameo appearance from what I'm gathering is your kid in the back. Monk won't realize that he's currently muted because I technically muted him as the admin a little while ago, but he can go ahead and unmute himself now. Monk, why don't you go ahead and introduce your history with the game and your involvement with Utopia? He's still muted, by the way, but we're going to let him realize that. It's fine. Oh, do I have to do it? Is this my fault? Hang on. He's not muted. Well, he's unmuted now. It might be my fault. Let's try again. Okay. Hey, there so, he is. You can hear me now. Okay, all right. Yep. Thanks for that. So, uh, hi, everyone. Um, I'm Monk. Uh, I started playing when I was probably around 13, 12, because my brother was playing it. So I thought it was cool around uh, the change of the century. Uh, so Utopia wise, I ended up playing with uh, Jeff, I think. Or actually it was uh, a guy called Smash Kiss who brought me into Panties and I met Jeff and eventually I also played in Serenity. Um, and I've had a long history of coding stuff for Utopia, be it uh, small kingdom forums that had small passes to being the somewhat famous login script that some people used to bypass uh, cookie management and proxy usage. Uh, but I, I also had a kingdom site. Uh, I then didn't play the game from around 2005 or something until 2011. Um, so I came back to the game probably after Sean and Brian relaunched it a little bit after. And um, figured that it really needed another good setup for kingdom management and tools and started coding that. And it was uh, by playing with, with Jeff that it really kicked off and uh, I just got users and and made Monkbot what it is today. And when David and Jeff bought the game, uh, I was lucky enough to get involved and has uh, I've been coding for the game and introduced some of the new features. What was the worst thing you've ever coded that gave you an unfair advantage in the game, Monk? Are you allowed to tell us? Because we all want to know. Mm, unfair advantage. Um, Everyone wants to know. <laughs> well, I mean, first of all, I have to think about what it could be, and then whether or not I actually want to admit I've done something. Proteus but, uh, is in chat taking notes. Um... I mean, I think uh, I've gotten to know some of the, the gameplay uh, rules um, by coding them and getting a lot of data. So I think having a lot of access to game data and figuring out what might be the optimal Oh, that's thing. kind of cool, actually. So like reverse engineering formulas and stuff like that. Yeah, I did a thing uh, a few ages ago before where I reverse engineered the store function, for example. Um, but I did make that available to everyone, so I didn't end up having an advantage as such. But you know, it's some of those things. And of course, you know, the logging script, having you know, being able to log in everywhere. Uh, I didn't. I, it, it was more worthwhile getting people to pay to use it than abuse the access I had. But I guess potentially, yes, I'm, I'm not going to repeat a couple of the accusations flying around chat right now. Suffice to say, they're <laughs> thoroughly, thoroughly amusing. All right, and uh, well, yes. Yeah, so... I, I, if I can just be allowed, because I can see Smash yeah. is is, uh, is on the chat, so I just want to do a shout out to him as he's the one who walked <laughs> into the 
the top living game in nice life. very very nice uh, oh man pansies I'm, I'm gonna get so much utopia nostalgia so uh i, I want to make sure i don't accidentally just do that and nothing else right now that would be disastrous um we do have an agenda to go through as you guys can see on the right hand side so we've just started with intro let me actually see if my little uh if my little moving shield thing works hang on Th this is considered pro tech stuff in the world of utopia let's go and no it's not working boo it was supposed to move, and I promise it was in rehearsal, but that's fine. We've started off with introductions, and we're next going to be going into um, a synopsis of the age that just finished, age 71. <clears throat> now, for those of us who don't play Utopia... Uh, oh, hang on. I need to... I'm going to disable push to talk in a second, because it just keeps doing this to me. My apologies. Uh, but for those of us who don't play Utopia, we're going to be moving on to a synopsis of Age 71 at this point. And uh, it ages last typically between, I'd say, 13 and 16 weeks, give or take three months, uh, plus a bit. And Utopia is kind of like, I'm tempted to say, if there's such a thing as rounds, it's quite possibly the longest round time of any MMORPG in existence. The entire game gets reset every time an age ends. And then when a new age begins with rule changes or balance tweaks or whatnot, you then have groups of 25 people organized in kingdoms uh, who basically fight for supremacy over what is effectively a three-month period. It is one of the longest-running, most tenacious, most hardcore, uh, mathematically grueling games on the planet if you really wanted to take it that way, which presumably is what uh, Monk loves so much. So uh, great that it brought him here, but obviously there's quite a lot to do and the ages, they're infinitely complex and they last a long time. So we just had an age finish, it was age 71. Um, and I'll let the guys talk about it in a little bit more detail, but basically it was one where a single kingdom managed to top the charts in the amount of land the kingdom had, uh, in the net worth of the kingdom, and also the amount of honor that the kingdom had as well. And I'll let someone else explain the honor mechanic so that I can take a break. Um, but I will tactically avoid talking about the end of last age unless someone decides to ask a pointed question. Who wants to open with how age 71 went? Monk, do you have any, any opinions to start us off? Mm, well, I mean, if, from my perspective, um, of course, I've been out of the top play. I haven't otherwise uh, been quite involved in the top play. For many ages um i mean the main thing i uh, noticed from uh, you could say the top uh, part of the game was what happened at the uh, at the end of the age and it was actually quite uh it's quite nice for once not to be involved in it because what appeared to me was that uh, we had a kingdom leading the charts for the whole age and uh, by yeah. some reason they ended up not actually winning the age which uh, it was actually not something you, you see that often I'm uh, definitely not going to take partial credit for that at all. Um, maybe we can talk about that a little bit later. Uh, I see a smile slowly creeping across Jeff's face. Maybe something to add? Uh, no, I, I don't think I have anything to add about how the, the age ended. What about, what about the rest of it? I mean, the, obviously we're going to be talking about age 72 and changes and stuff like that, so we won't go into that now, but maybe as an analysis of age 71 and how things went in the game, uh, the, you can kind of spot some of the patterns, if you like, that led to the thinking that led to the changes for age 72. Sure. So, um, you know, age 71 was our first full age of owning the game. Obviously, the, the game got moved uh in in age 70 and there were a couple of things that we wanted to look at uh with regard to changes for age 71 and i think that we were able to make some changes that fit pretty well with the direction we were looking at um and and specifically we were able to focus on some of the server issues and gameplay problems um that people have noticed for a long time although i'll let monk talk a little bit about what we did there, um, but but I think that was sort of the focus of age seventy one for me. 
Fair enough. David, have you got anything to add there? Because uh, obviously you guys work together to uh, effectively analyze what Age 71 would bring about in terms of what you wanted to do next with the game. Yeah, well, a lot of, you know, what you saw happen, like Jeff said, in Age 70, uh, we had a kingdom that triple crowned, which, you know, doesn't happen very often. And for it to happen in Age 70, and then again in Age 71, you know, there's just... There's something that was happening and, you know, call it net worth manipulation, soldier dropping, whatever you want to call it. You know, it's not something that is fun for the game. It's not fun for the people that are doing it. And it's just something that we really wanted to address. Amen. And, Waking up at 4 a.m. Jesus. Yeah. So, <laughs> you know, it's just it's not something that we wanted to promote in any way. We wanted to do as much as we can, we could to stop it and you know make it something that just couldn't be done anymore so uh you know that was kind of a result from seeing the triple crown in 70 the triple crown in 71 and the methods that they used to get there um so you know we took those those things that came from that and and tried to come up with ways that would make the game more enjoyable for everybody and uh you know, present that new dynamic to the gameplay that, you know, people just don't, you don't see, you haven't seen in quite a while. Uh, you know, then there were some other things that happened throughout, you know, age 71 too. Um, you know, we had some drama in the early age with some smaller kingdoms taking advantage of the shell kingdoms that they created, not filling them out with all the invites that they were given. Uh, utilizing the explorer formula to you know their advantage um you know things like that that you know we offer the ability to create a, a kingdom with you and your friends um but you know the ultimate goal is really to you know grow your kingdom to be a competitive size which is you know 20 to 25 yeah sure not you know stay five people big uh, and you know utilize the mechanics of the game that you know they, they just they weren't implemented by people who understood you know what could be done with it and um, you know that's one of the things that the, the four of us being really in control of what's happening understand better you know we we've been players we we are players and we know the thought process that goes into you know, why people are doing things. Sure. I, I think it might be worth the chat, um, <clears throat> especially because not everyone, um, well, not everyone's a player, not, but not everyone would have been a player in one of the top kingdoms that was necessarily abusing some of these mechanics. It might be worth uh, just having a bit of a recap on like what kind of abuse was actually taking place. Um, so I can, I can explain soldier dropping, which is effectively holding as much of the net worth in your province as possible as a massive soldier ball so you're looking at basically being 85 percent drafted and having like tens of thousands of soldiers when you were thousands of acres large and each soldier i believe was worth uh two uh just exactly two net worth so the idea is that just before you make a hit with your ridiculously large offense you send 50 to 100 thousand soldiers to the next guy and that suddenly drops your net worth by quite a bit and puts you into 80 to 100 and 20% net worth range of a whole bunch of other provinces that normally you would never consider attacking because the gains would be rubbish. So it's effectively abusing the gains formula, but done in such a way that you're deliberately dropping your net worth to go in range, you make your hit, and then people immediately send you the soldiers back so that you're te you have a little bit more defense and you're kind of out of range again. And people were just doing this in the top kingdoms nonstop. Um, and we'll, we'll have a discussion, I suppose, at the end of this segment about what should be done about it instead, but I would assume the natural progression, rather than people doing something like that, is to have most of the top kingdoms of a similar size war each other instead of, I don't know, sitting on, like, CFs for three to six weeks and waiting for that opportunity to fight each other. Maybe they should just be having more scrappy fights more often or something like that. Uh, and then the second uh the the second sort of bit of abuse uh you mentioned was to do with the explore formula uh, dave jeff does do either of you want to hop in on that to sort of shed a bit of light on that yeah sure um <clears throat> the explore formula had a 
qualifier that penalized kingdoms that were under a certain size. And if you just had that one additional province in your kingdom, you removed the penalty and you were able to take advantage of the median, which is that magic uh, part of the formula that allows you to uh, either, you know, double your size or, um, you know, have these vastly increased costs. So um, kingdoms would stay small intentionally <clears throat> to uh, take advantage of that median uh, with some of their larger provinces that would normally not be able to. And, uh, you know, just that having that threshold of provinces in the kingdom for the penalty to be so low, it just, it just didn't make much sense. So we increased that quite a bit so that, you know, we really want to see kingdoms grow. We want to see kingdoms get to the competitive sizes and, you know, have, you know, enjoy the game the way it was meant to be enjoyed. Fair enough. And there will be, um, there are actually questions later on about kingdom size, by the way. If anyone's in the chat going, talk about it now! It's going to be towards the end of the broadcast, but we have that down as something to discuss. Mm -hmm. And and then, I guess to close things off for Age 71 and where we're all at, uh, Bishop, we haven't spoken much to you so far, but uh, it would be interesting to know where, where you were playing and sort of what your view was uh, from the place you were sat on, in terms of what went down and just in terms of how you felt the age went in general in terms of the health of the game. Yeah, sorry, I was just making a chat. Um, so, uh, from age 71, or the last age, um, I played fairly actively for the first two months and I came in with um, Corp and Mango and some other bunch of people. Um, but because we got busy with Utopia, you know, doing support work and that towards the end, I didn't play for that last month. So, I wasn't really watching all the drama that happened with the charts with the uh, people not withdrawn from war and um, getting farmed out and stuff. You'll, you'll have to lean in a little bit, Bishop. Although the yeah, part yeah. of the chat wants you to lean in, take off your glasses, and then make a smile to try and like, you know, look a bit like your avatar. But I feel like we'd be giving them what they want too early. <laughs> um, so like a lot of this, a lot of the time we spent last day was just chatting about stuff, chatting about like the knock-on effects of you know the, of the kingdom sizes contracting or the player base contracting, and um, because network dropping wasn't really that that um, much of a deal when there's lots of targets, but when people start hitting the whore caps. And they have to start manipulating their work to hit down. That's when it really becomes apparent. And when, when one kingdom's successful with a, a strategy, a lot of kingdoms will jump on it then, you know, and try and uh, replicate it because it's the most successful way to win. So we spend a lot of time talking about that. And um, we also spend a lot of time, and Christian can probably say a bit more um, about the oops messages and stuff. And uh, there was a hell of a lot of work in the back end that a lot of the players wouldn't have seen <clears> with regards <throat> to changing servers and updating bits and pieces and just changing the back end and the admin stuff that we have to do. Um, I don't think a lot of the guys realize how much work goes on behind the scenes to keep things running and to, you know, mess with that and, <coughs> and things like that. Like, so there can be quite a lot of work that goes on in that regard. Um, I think I ended up the age, the last age. I think I dropped like a thousand acres in the last, the last day or two and then I got disappointed with myself and stopped playing. You should stop, stop suiciding Emirati with 24 hours to go. It just doesn't work. I didn't even attack. I don't think. <laughs> <laughs> you, you bring uh you, you mentioned a really interesting point actually about the oops messages and a lot of the stuff that goes on behind the scenes and M monk uh do you want to shed a little bit of light because i think there was probably there was a notable maybe two day period or maybe not quite two day period in the game where people were actually quite consistently getting these messages but they were only ever outages for like 10 or 15 seconds at a time but they were there quite consistently what was being fixed in the back end so um so generally, I mean, uh, for people to also understand why oopsing uh, occurs at all, I think it's worth mentioning um, how they come about. And the, the simple answer is that uh, whenever something happens to a province, the database has to lock in how it, it started out looking a province, then have stuff happen to it, and then return how it would look at after what has happened. But when you have two people at the same time doing something to the same province, then they have to queue because they can't happen at the same time. Um, and what was happening, uh, if something was going on at the same time, it, it would then throw one of the, the requests out and give the oops message. Right, um, okay. I th okay, I think I get yeah. it. Basically, everything has to agree in order to resolve. Yeah, so you would have, because otherwise, if you don't have this consistent, uh, you could imagine that, for example, war win bonuses being applied to provinces 
but at the exact same <laughs> question, uh, second, someone just uh, attacks a province. And so when the attack calculation is made, it's kind of having a fixed point that was how did the province look beforehand, perform the attack upon the province, and then return how the, the province would then look. And then it would lose out potentially of this war win bonus. So there has to be some checks and balances to make sure things are going at the right speed or in the right consecutive order. Right. Um, and so, um, so that was something major we wanted to address. Uh, something that, uh, this is an uh, aside thing, because you were mentioning that often during uh, specific times during a tick, there would be more oopsing than otherwise. And that had to do with uh, my first implementation of this kingdom dump that um, was actually made to try to relieve some of the pressure on the server by making it uh, not necessary for, but to spam the server to collect data. Uh, but for us to provide it going through all the provinces and making a, a big dump for people to use. But actually that in itself for one minute was was hammering the server, so to speak, and causing some oops. Um, but that, of course, eventually was fixed. Um, and so, so now I, the I mean, kingdom dump is uh, available and working correctly and everything is fine with that now. Yeah, so now it kind of collects <clears throat> running it every time. Then they also update the dump, so to speak. So it's being updated all the time instead of uh, some script going through every province and locking it uh, while trying to get this uh, kingdom done uh, four times an hour so that's been fixed um and uh by the way if you want to get access to the kingdom dump just reach out to us yeah uh, definitely um we can talk about it later because uh, i do wish that uh, someone makes some cool I'm going to find it based on it, but uh, yeah, I might end up. I imagine the kingdom dump is like there's a there's a room in a basement somewhere where there are just constantly like printouts of every province in the game on sheets of paper flying at you from all directions. And if you look closely in the middle, there's a half eaten pizza carton and flogger sat in the middle of the room. It's, it's something like that. In, in the, uh, you can describe it like that. Maybe a couple of a couple of cans of Mountain Dew chucked in the corner or something. I don't know. <laughs> um, but if you want to just wrap up uh, kind of what uh, happened with the whole thing. So uh, originally when I came on to the team and tried to look at the code, we had a lot of thoughts of how we could fix this all from changing the code base, the framework, the server, the database type and whatnot. Um, and what in the end kind of fixed it was uh, kind of a, a simple uh, concept, which is basically when a request fails, then we try the whole request a couple of times because in the end when when a deadlock occurs which is what happens when two acts at the same time it can actually be resolved within a fraction of a second and simply just retrying it uh, will often lead to success and that in the end is uh, for a large degree to insert this middle layer that uh, handles this this concept of retrying uh, a request is, is actually what has fixed that for sure. the most part but also the fact that we've considerably um, lessened the load on the server by external bots, like bots trying to collect the kingdom data, and also the the app, the, the Android and the iOS uh, third party app. None of those bots yeah. were monks, by the way. None of them, honestly. <laughs> honestly, not. Not, uh, <laughs> not this time. <laughs> um, but also, I mean, there were some extensions for browsers and uh, the apps. Uh, and by analyzing the uses of the server, it was possible to kind of pinpoint uh, unintended and unfavorable ways of them interacting with the server, causing a lot of, of strain that would also uh, make the likelihood of these oopsies higher. So, uh, I mean, a combined effort on different kind of paths has uh, kind of led to the situation today where at least uh, when I monitor <coughs> the server, it's, uh, it's humming along quite nicely. Fair dues. All right. Well, in the interests of time, I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna move the conversation along to objectives for age seventy two. I just realized we're nearly forty minutes in, and we're like about a third of the way through our agenda. So this is gonna be interesting. I uh, hope you guys don't have uh, meetings planned <laughs> later. I I think this is. This is quite fun because we've taken a look at what happened in H71. We've discussed some of the things that occurred, some of the bugs that we had to squash as well. But really, it's before we talk about like changes and the new introductions to the game, we have to talk about the thinking behind uh, not just the things that we wanted to fix, but also the things that we want to improve. 
and sort of coming into age 72 it we want to understand a little bit more about what that process was like and i i actually think bishop it would make sense to start with you here um I, it would be interesting to hear what your input is on the development and the direction of the game from a balance point of view but regardless of your answer to that question to also hear what you think you would have liked to see as a player from playing in age 71. Um, the objective was going into age 72. Well, obviously the prior, the, the main one was to stop network manipulation, you know, stop people with soldier dropping and moving them around. So we were considering originally going to a pure land based gains formula, um, which we had before, but then we were chatting about it for a while and we didn't, we couldn't think of an elegant way to solve the problems that used to occur with land based gains, which is just and just pumping on the same acres and then you know, hammering people when they moved up. So uh, we decided to go to kind of a hybrid type um, gains formula. Um, so we spent a while testing that out and then we made some tweaks when it went live and we saw some of the, the outliers weren't working the way that we wanted. But the main goal from that was uh, <coughs> just to stop all the, the, the massive network dropping. Um, but we didn't want to make it too complicated so that people couldn't kind of intuitively understand what they needed to do. So we wanted them to know that you know, we kind of hit someone the same size as you. Um, what network and land. So when it get a pretty decent gain out of it. When it comes to uh, discussing and talking through these changes, is it the four of you guys that are effectively the committee that helps try and decide that, or are there more people involved? Like, what does that process look like? Um, well, there, are, there are all four of us will be chatting on Slack. We usually have a conversation on there, and we have calls every so often as well to discuss things. But we also have um, a test server where you can see. Um, type of attacks that people are making and what they're doing to see how that how our thought process has been translated into game code and how that actually plays out in the real world because it's difficult to, to think of ideas and um, they never really survive by a first contact things always change and you always get different types of emergent gameplay when you've got you know three and a half thousand people trying to trying to get the best uh, manipulation out, out of the game's quirks and that and so um, it's always good to try and test them out a bit see that wasn't an option that we had before when going and sean were managing the game they didn't have uh, the time to set up multiple test servers and to run different instances and try things out you know they basically yeah. just rocked up at the end of the age for a week or two beforehand started hammering through changes and then um, that was it so it's good now that we've got uh, time to discuss things throughout the age and see how things are going we can kind of take notes as we're going along with like what's working now what's what's not working later on so it's, it's a lot more of a smoother process it's a lot more organic that way as well and as a player, were there any changes that um, you personally thought, oh, that would have been really useful if I had that this age while I was playing in the kingdom I was playing in? Or was your involvement mostly just with the four of you guys chatting on Slack? No, I always try and keep playing so I can see, you know, um, um, how the changes are actually being received by all the different kingdoms, especially like I usually play in lower ranked kingdoms if I can. So one of the things that definitely heard loud and clear was that people didn't like the randomness of the science uh, spawn. It wasn't um, predictable enough. They couldn't see, um, despite the fact that labs might have buffed the science spawn rate, they couldn't see a tangible effect on that. You know, it was too random. They might hit a, hit a row of hidden four or five scientists uh, in a few hours, and they mightn't see another one for a good few hours then. And even though like that would have evened out over the course of the age, it, um, it just didn't feel good for the players. So I think it was the current science, scientist spawn. That's an awful lot nicer. I much prefer that myself. <laughs> because here's a better sense of where it's coming from. Fair enough. And I usually face race every age as well. Like I like science. Okay. Um, and I'm, I'll throw to Monk next. Um, when, when it came to discussing the changes for age 72, before you actually hammered down something concrete that you were going to put into practice, um, how did you feel the discussion about objectives and what you wanted to, uh, what you wanted to achieve were? We talked about eliminating the net worth manipulation uh, when it came to making hits. Was there was there anything else that you felt was quite major that you wanted to get rid of as well? Well, me personally, I mean, my role in in making changes uh, has actually been mainly just the implementation and giving some feedback. Uh, so in actually formulating our objectives, uh, I've kind of let uh, the other three do that because uh, once they've gotten it, gotten their objective, then there's uh, enough to do in the actual coding. So um, so it's only once they've made up their minds, I might have some input saying, I feel this and that. But otherwise, um, 
my objective is to make sure they're really sure on what they want to do so I don't do something that they'll change their mind. Cool, then I guess uh, it probably makes sense now to uh, give the floor to David and Jeff, who will no doubt talk us through a lot of the objectives, not whether you were successful or not in implementing them. We'll come on to that in a bit, but your goals generally in balancing what is basically your first full age in charge of Utopia. I'll go first. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I, I think you know, we came to the age with the idea that we wanted to have themes for ages, right? And those themes could align in some fashion with the ways that gameplay might interact or, or work in certain ways. Um, and so, you know, moving into that, we thought that this age would be interesting to look at strengthening some of the hybrids both from a military standpoint and from an effectiveness standpoint focusing on uh, both reducing the power of single large safe provinces um, and Ooh. looking at sorry that was my attempt at a cow ah uh, yes yes the, the thank cows you. Thank you very if much. you will <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, and and you know and then also sort of adding back in a, a new race and a, a new personality that had some themes that people were looking for um, and, and sort of looking at how they worked out. Dave? Yeah, so um, it, it's actually, Bishop touched on this a little earlier. It's, you know, the age changes don't, you know, get thought up in an afternoon where we get together and talk about stuff and figure everything out. It takes quite a long time. We, you know, have our uh, a specific channel set up where we start taking notes, you know, now on what we're going to do for next stage. And we've got a, you know, a shared document that we keep notes in to see exactly what's going on, what we need to change and, um, you know, come up with ideas for, for, for the next stage. You know, there's a lot of, there's a lot more than goes into it than just, you know, uh, the week before we, we come up with some changes and, you know, Hey, let's try this. You know, it's not, it's not quite like that. Um, we, we take the feedback and the suggestions that people, uh, right in the forums pretty seriously. Um, this age was really meant to be about giving back to the community and uh, really looking at what people have been asking for, looking for, uh, and just really focusing on the existing player base and making you, everybody feel like you know their opinion matters and um, giving them something that they've been looking for for a while. Uh, you know, that's where the new race comes in, the new personality. And of course, you know, Bishop, mentioned the net worth manipulation you know you, is the reason why two ages in a row kingdoms have been able to triple crown so you know we could not let that continue uh it's just it wasn't fun for the game we had to figure out a way to to deal with it um so coming up with uh how to make the uh, gains formula work um you know what's the goal what are we trying to accomplish and then um you know that's um, a little bit where, you know, Monk comes in to play, uh, you know, the three of us really get together. We talk about all the changes for however long it takes. We come up with a set of, uh, items that we want to change with our kind of thoughts on what to do. We present everything sort of to Monk and he's, he'll give us his feedback on, you know, how is it going to code? How's it going to work? You know, what's it going to be affected by it? And, uh, and we make some, you know, final tweaks going from there. Um, sure. So I guess in summary, we have a new race, a new personality, uh, just to sort of inject some enthusiasm into the game and sort of generate a bit of excitement. Um, of course, Kingdom Rituals are a completely new thing as well. And we are trying to remove the, and we'll talk about in practice how that gets implemented in a second, removing the net worth uh, manipulation stuff. And then uh, I think one thing perhaps we haven't uh, spoken about too much is uh, the new gains formula. We've mentioned how 
like we didn't want to go into something land-based so it's now a little bit of a hybrid it's obviously a mystery so we're not going to be talking about it in the next section when we discuss in detail everything that's been implemented but talk to me about what the object well what the objectives were and what your thinking was when you decided to go hang on a second let's try something new and come up with some sort of hybrid strategy and do you think it's weak in any way? Do you think it's like open to maybe not quite being right? Do you see any scenarios where it still needs to be tweaked? Well, uh, that's a very good question. We uh, we actually, as you know, you and probably everybody else knows, there was a hot fix made. Uh, I think it was about two days into the age where we had adjusted the formula to what to where we thought you know would be acceptable for this age, understanding completely that it's going to change again. It's not going to be a perfect science right away. We need to, you know, just see how it's going to play out and then adjust it again later. You know, it took a, a long time to get the existing formula the way it worked for so long uh, right. And it's going to take us a little bit of time to get our formula right as well. So we made that hot fix right away as soon as we know things were not working the way we had expected or wanted them to. And uh, we feel that now it should um, you know, work well throughout the rest of the age to do, you know, to com achieve the goals that we're looking for from it and, um, you know, create that new dynamic that, you know, nobody knows how exactly it works. So everybody is experimenting and trying new things and trying to figure out what's working. Uh, the most important part is, you know, when you think you know what might work well, you need to actually set up your kingdom for that and to take full advantage of it. Monk, um, how much do I need to pay you to get the formula? <laughs> um, well, let's talk about that afterwards. Okay, after after the broadcast, um, we're gonna move now uh, to what will hopefully be the meat of the broadcast, where we start talking about the changes made and the actual discussion about what happened. So. Uh, we spoke a little bit about the gains formula just now. We're going to move a little bit into what it actually did this age. Um, Jeff, I'm going to start with you this time. And I'm going to ask the one question on everyone's mind because it's a massive objective. How does the new gains formula remove net worth manipulation from the top kingdoms? Uh, well, the the hope is that the new gains formula either removes or significantly reduces the value of net worth manipulation from top kingdoms by reducing the potential rewards. Um, in the cases where top kingdoms are using net worth manipulation to attack, they're attacking provinces that are much smaller than themselves in land, right? Um, and by including land as a factor in the gains, it's going to mean that the end result is a fewer, a smaller number of acres gained as the the, the gap there is larger. Sure. Um, and and mean that risk the, the well. attack time is larger. Right. Yeah, makes sense. Okay, cool. And then, uh, so moving away from that now, because we have covered that a fair bit. Um, who wants to jump in? In fact, whose idea first was Kingdom Rituals? At some point, it was someone's brainchild. Who was it? Uh, so actually... Uh, credit where credit's due, it really came out of uh, stuff that Pepe posted um, in the forums a couple of times. Uh, I think he called them shamans. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I had seen it and been thinking about it for a while. And um, then I just kind of said, hey, we're, we're going to do this. And uh, it went from there. Fair dues. And uh, how, have you, how have you seen it? uh in terms of how it's worked out is it roughly how you kind of have envisioned it to be if you like is this how you expected it to work uh is it too easy too difficult to implement you obviously have some sort of data of, on the pickup rates and how easy it was to get kingdoms organized to do it the co the top kingdoms obviously have been able to cast the rituals as and when they need to um do you feel that's something that's been resonating throughout the whole player base it's not something that's too complicated for the casual players to come in and enjoy as well um i don't know that there's enough data yet you know one of the things with spells is that they start out harder to cast early in the age and become easier later in the age and there's an argument that perhaps we need to look at that um, shift as it relates to, you know, land size and science and, and rune generation. 
Um, you know, because we wanted rituals to be at a place where they were hard to cast and not just completely trivial. Sure. And, you know, the concern is when you have, you know, max production science and, you know, you're a little bigger because of how the, the rune costs scale, it starts to look closer to, to um, trivial. Um, you know, I, I feel like um, anecdotally, it seems like it's in a pretty good place for kingdoms larger than 20 provinces. Um, for smaller kingdoms, it's a, it's a little harder to tell. Um, yeah. Fair dues. Well, we'll see. Uh, we'll be quite eagerly awaiting uh, the feedback, especially from the smaller kingdoms as well later on in the age, because ultimately uh, the player base and growth, which I presume we'll touch on as well, um, will be reliant on us getting uh, new players into the game, even though I must stress the current trend seems to be looking positive. So I'm going to move on to the next thing, and uh, this time I'm going to I'm going to start with you, Bishop, and uh, ask you about the new race and personality that was added to the game. Uh, what you think of them? What you think of Dryad and Paladin? And also, because I come from a like Warcraft three background, how Dryads with four legs take twenty five percent longer to do anything? That that to me makes absolutely no sense. Someone's going to have to explain this. Um. Yeah, um, well, actually, I'll start with Paladin first because we we talked about the mechanic whereby um, kingdom mates could cast spells on each other, and we I know we had that previously, um, but it led to a couple of abuses. You know, like everyone casting paradise in the big cow province, and but we liked the idea of um, bringing kingdoms together so that everyone was kind of working towards the same goal, much much the same as rituals. We thought that um, a personality that could help buff the kingdom would be really useful. So it was born out of that, like I guess. Um, we had talked originally about you know making them um, be able to cast spells and others as part of a racial feature, but we thought it fitted better on a personality. Okay. So far, it seems to be, it seems to be working pretty solidly. There's only two paladins in my kingdom, and both refuse to cast spells. It sounds like it's working great. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, but I, I think it is actually working pretty well. It's 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 bringing a lot more communication to people. They're talking a lot more about you know how the province is, what help they need, and um, the fact that we moved Inspire Army away from the spell. That was on every race that everybody had to have up all the time um, and pushed it on the paladin uh, i thought that was a pretty interesting dynamic though. yeah nesta mod if you guys are watching i haven't had inspire army once this age what's the deal man i mean <laughs> sort yourselves out unbelievable that 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 puts an awful lot of pressure on paladins to be like the most active yeah, provinces in, was, in a way yeah and that was that was obviously one of the downsides that we talked about the fact that you know if um if you have a paladin, everyone's going to be crying out for their spells. But at the same time, we thought like, look, we think we can do this in a way that it make that it makes sense and that people will enjoy doing as well. A lot of people like to they tend to be less aggressive when they're playing. They might not enjoy attacking as much, or they might they might like helping out their their kingdom. Um, and it's um, it's tricky to make a kind of tanky prop or a tanky class in the game. So we figured out one that could kind of self buff other players was uh, just a pretty good fit, and there was definitely room for it. Like fitted in thematically as well, because it's important that we've got enough distinction between races and personalities so that they kind of all feel unique enough and that they just fit properly. All right. Well, you can't avoid it any longer. Let's talk Dryad. I mean, and let let's let's get the elephant out of the room as well. Let's talk why Dryad and not Dark Elves. Let's let's have it, guys. Dark Elves. Well, like I think everyone knows when they say Dark Elves, what they mean is they want a race yes, that has uh, no rooms in it, right? Yes, and then That's usually what people are looking for. <laughs> Sounds about right. Yeah, especially Texan. I think he's always growing out of the <laughs> Indeed he is. Uh, but was was Dryad something that came to you guys like uh, relatively quickly? Did, did you find... Did you find that uh, it is relatively to the design you wanted it to be? Because I know that one of the things you guys said pre-broadcast... Uh, as Bishop slowly slips into darkness but is rescued, um, is you didn't quite have the uptake you necessarily expected from Dryad. Although, to be perfectly honest, I think I can give you one big fat reason why. But, 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 before I do that, obviously, Monk, um, Dryad, as a, as a concept, um, when, when you were implementing, what were your immediate thoughts? What, what was your raw emotion when you were coding that into the game? Well, I have to be honest and, um, and say until this point that you mentioned before where it came from, I actually had no idea where it comes from. 
so for the most part, I was mainly just confused by the name and getting it wrong all the time and not knowing how to even say it. So um, suffice to say, that's, that's been my stance on it. And when when you were when you were coding the race into the game, did you think it was something that you would consider playing? Well, anyone who's ever played with me knows play a fairy doing almost nothing but just doing ops. So yeah, no, not really. Also, I didn't really know what it would do, <laughs> and I didn't want to play something I wouldn't be able to even say. So um, no. <laughs> Fair enough. Um, D David, Jeff, you guys have just been quietly chuckling away. Let's let's have a discussion about the take up rate of Dryad, where Dryad came from conceptually, and what what you think uh, what you think of the new addition to the game. Yeah, I'll let Jeff start. <laughs> so um, you know, we we decided that we did want to add a, a new race, and with Dark Elves, we wanted to give people some time to adapt to not getting the free runes. Um, so, you know, coming in, we, we really wanted the idea of the treant attacker, actually, you know, the, the slow one that, you know, maybe would work well for new players, but we couldn't get the <laughs> balance of it exactly right. Um, Dryads are so, bloody quick. They're fast, so, man. They're like second fastest after avians. Look, look, look. They have to absorb the forest into their forest. It takes a lot of time to incorporate that land into what they already have. Also, can I just say, um, wisps are like the base unit. They're like the weakest, most blur kind of thing. Night elves, by the way, Warcraft people. Dryads more basically have. How are they suddenly like, what, like a 1411 elite or something that looks horrendously good? Uh, the, the Will of the Wisps are something like, uh, 142, I believe. Um, oh, that's a lot worse than 1411. I take that back. Uh, yeah. Yeah. The, the 1411 <laughs> was the, the original lead, I think on the, on the treant, um, before we, we pulled them out. Um, but you know, the, so, you know, offense and defense are ultimately reflections of not who would win if you locked two of them in a room and they fought each other so much as effectiveness at taking land, right? Sure. Or, or protecting land, I should say, uh, depending on, on the nature of the elite. Um, and so, you know, with, with some of the changes we were making to the other races, we realized that it didn't really make sense for Orc to be both the exclusive bearer of high offense and the race with significant benefits to games. Um, and so we thought that there was a niche available for a high offense attacker, but we wanted to be careful about introducing a high offense attacker um, into the game. And, and I think if you read the forums, you could see that there was a ton of feedback that Dryads would actually be totally overpowered because they had so much offense. I think that was the gut reaction a lot of people had. Um, but, you know, we we did think that perhaps they would be a little less strong than some of the other attackers going in. Um, and we were okay with that, uh, you know, because it is something new that's being added and we wanted to make sure that it worked well with the other races. Okay, so you think it's maybe something that is, and I guess we'll see as time goes on, but maybe there's more uh, of a pickup amongst the players that aren't in the top organized kingdoms, and they're actually quite a good fit in, if you like, the meta game sort of outside of the top 20, if you will, where you do actually get these kind of attackers making the difference with the big gains and single hits. That's the the hope. Fair it is. And da David... I, I thought you promised me Spartans as a race. Where did that go? Um, yeah, that didn't happen. Oh, oh well. I'll have to I'll have to consign myself to the uh, to the test server, but that's fine. <laughs> um, I want to have a chat uh, with you. In fact, I don't even want to have a chat with you. I want to say the word paradise, and have you talk back at me for age seventy two. Uh, well, Paradise 
was, you know, in the proposed changes, we thought about making it not take from the explore pool. And um, that just brings a host of new problems that would just force anybody who is trying to compete for top land uh, to mm. paradise all the time. Dice nonstop. You know, yeah. Yeah. It just, if you weren't paradising, you weren't going to win. So um, we had considerable discussions about how to actually make it so that that wouldn't happen. And, uh, you know, one of the solutions we had come up with was putting it onto Mystic and Rogue only. Uh, the entire idea behind the spell to begin with was um, to provide a way for those thief mages, uh, a way to grow um, other than through exploring. You know, they can't attack. And if their only option is to explore, they gave they had this other option. Mind um, stream. Yeah, right. <laughs> so um the you know that's where that mystic and rogue only came from um but we eventually just scrapped the idea of having it not take from the explore pool even though they're you know personal uh explore pools now um we decided to not have it do that because it just we we did so much so many big things this age with the gains, war wins, you know, just everything that's changed. We didn't want to just add this other dynamic that just would, you know, probably be a little too much. Fair enough. Um, so I'm going to move on now. Uh, I've got two things left to talk about in terms of changes for Age 72. The first, I guess we might as well just have it as a little bit of a recap, but the explore penalty that's now been introduced. Can uh, Does someone want to volunteer to explain in a nutshell to the layman how that works? Uh, explore penalty? Well, I mean, yeah. you want to go if you want? Yeah, sure. So basically before uh, the explore cost, uh, one element on of it was the median size uh, in the kingdom. Uh, so if uh, one might appreciate the small kingdom of five provinces, it would be easier to have a high median, but that would be the third province in said kingdom. Whereas in a kingdom of 20, it would be the, uh, the 11th or the 10th province would have to have a high median size. And so what was the abuse was that a kingdom could be of five provinces and then more easily stack acres on the top three provinces and have a high median and sure. then have low export costs. And before there was a cutoff at five provinces, if you were lower than that, your costs in general would be quite higher to prevent this uh, happening in a kingdom of only three. Yeah. And so we up that limit to avoid the kingdom of five situation because that was uh, not how we intend to be used. Otherwise, out player's empire would crown. <laughs> Can't have it on. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Fair enough. All right. I, I want to get on to the last thing uh, that I have here to talk about uh, in terms of this age's changes. And I'm going to lump them into one. It's pretty interesting. We have changes to the war win bonus. But in addition to that, we also have the propose war function, which is completely new. And uh, we're attempting to take more of the game off of IRC and put it into the game interface itself. Um, who who feels best equipped to talk us through the war changes in a nutshell? I think Jeff's probably... Uh, Don't make me do it, man. Uh-oh. Um, <laughs> so uh, I, I missed the first part of the question, but the second part of the question was related to proposed war. Jeff, um, stop, yeah. stop reading Bart's messages and love notes. It's just, <laughs> it's not worth it, buddy. Um, no, the first part of the question was changes to the war win bonus combined with proposed war. Right. Um, so, you know, Proposed war is really just designed to help all the kingdoms that are arranging war and, and dealing with, you know, oh, well, gee, you know, can I afford to give up the button? Can I not afford to give up the button? Um, and just give them an easy way to, to get into war if both sides have agreed. Um, you know, the, the war win bonus, we're, we're interested in encouraging conflict between kingdoms and you know, one of the ways we do that is improvements to the war win bonus for both the winner and the loser. You saw this last age when we improved 
the free building credits that both sides got from the war, including mm-hmm. what the, the, the loser got from the war. Um, because we feel like a lot of the players are really interested and, and enjoy the state of war relative to each other. Um, and, uh, and so, you know, I, I think, um, you know, that's, that's sort of the direction we were going with it. And, and yes, we recognize that, that there were a, a couple of small bugs that we've dealt with um, related to the rollout of uh, declaring wars. Um, but, you know, it's, it's something that, you know, we feel a lot of the players are interested in. But one of the issues, particularly in the war chart, has been that there's not a ton of incentive to war your direct competitors, right? If you're number two in war wins and you want to war number one in war wins, they might just say, eh, I don't want to war you, you know, I, I think we'd probably lose. And, and, and so it's, it's not really possible to um, force someone to, to protect their, their status in the same way. Um, and so to, in an attempt to encourage that conflict, we added the new thing where there's a modifier to war points in the war win chart based on the relative rank of your opponent. That makes a lot of sense. And it, to an extent, it's not just the war win chart as well, because the, oh, well, I guess it kind of is. What do you do to stop the number one and number two net worth kingdoms, <clears throat> not war each other, and instead sort of compete to see who can secure the later war against someone ranked lower so that they can get the war win bonus as late into the mm. age as possible you're going to get situations like that arising still um away from the war win chart right uh, sure i mean in in other charts there will always be competitions to see you know which kingdom manages to fight the weakest kingdom relative to them with the most resources available for taking <laughs> um you know, our, our goal is as much as possible to encourage that direct conflict. Um, but, you know, we'll we'll see how that works out. Fair enough. Uh, any, anyone else with anything to add in terms of the war mechanics and propose war? Um, I, I have a feeling we'll have more to talk about on this, like, once we actually have a few more top wars. The war stuff that we've been talking about is something that we've been looking at consistently. You need to make yeah. it, like... Warring cannot be worse than staying outside of war and just attacking other people. You need to make sure that the rewards for the time spent in war um, are worth it for the kingdoms. Because previously, if you entered war, you were at a real disadvantage to stay outside and die strip one. So, so that's why we try to make sure that it's really rewarding to enter. Whether you winning is definitely very good, but we don't want to make losing too hard of a punishment. But at the same time, you know, we want to give incentives to the winners. Is there. Um... Do, is there any merit, and I'm just asking off the top of my head, in uh, having longer wars reward more to effectively compensate for some of this effect that Bishop just mentioned? Where if you're in a war yeah, constantly, yeah, if if you're in a war and you're constantly exchanging land and you're up by enough to win, but you know not that much more than that, but your war drags on for a week, someone outside of you might have gained twenty percent of their land by then. Whereas if it's a min time war, then obviously that's great for you. But then the longer it drags on, the more everyone else overtakes you. Is is that a bit of an issue at the moment, or it, not really? I want to say it's not really an issue at the moment. At least, at least not yeah. what I've seen. I think, uh, to a large extent, people are not interested in long wars. At least, both in top kingdoms, there's the whole shaming. It, it very rarely does it feel nice to be in a war you're losing. And so I think that happens both in the top and the bottom. So I don't really see that as a huge problem. And if you're winning and if you keep in drag on, then you usually it's snowballing and you actually gain remember top wars. If you were winning and the other side hasn't realized it yet, often you would be weakening a lot of honor and extra land. So I'm not sure it's actually an issue. And, you know, the, the other factor there, and we won't discuss the details of how it's calculated, is that, you know, we do reward both kingdoms with additional explore pool that would scale up based on the length of the war. So to some extent, if a war runs longer, the additional explore pool available to both kingdoms will be a slightly larger size as well. Oh, uh, Q, Q discussions about uh, 
two kingdoms waving targets outside uh, of each other and then immediately proposing and accepting a war. <laughs> Bring them back. I suspect that's not going to happen anytime soon, though, so that will be fine. Right, we probably have to move on. Um, let's go ahead and take a look at... And this is interesting because I don't actually know what we're about to discuss, but there are some new features rolling out soon that David and Jeff were keen to get into the agenda, and... Mm -hmm. I have, David's looking slightly more worried than I hoped he would. So hopefully he has got something to add to the agenda where there are new features coming out soon. And we're going to talk to you guys about them. These aren't live in the game yet, but they will be. And uh, you'll get the chance to hear the guys talk about them first here before you ever see them on your screen. So who wants to start? Um, I mean, I can start, but uh, yeah, I'll start. So uh, a couple new things we're pretty excited to talk about and bring live to the game soon is uh, this idea of uh, gold status or you know a premium account and um, you know before everybody goes up in arms it's not going to be the entire aim will not be anywhere near a, a pay to win or a pay to play type uh, system but it'll uh, reward people um, that do have this gold status uh, a couple things that we're looking to add uh, functionality-wise for somebody with this gold account would be to uh, allow this sort of multi-spell or you know multiple thief ops to be performed at the same time. So, like you would have a you know an input box to choose the amount of um, times you wanted to you know tree of gold or paradise or night strike or you know something of that nature. So if you're and, a monk, you could write nine 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 nine. Yeah, and just infinitely, you know, just grow till you can't grow anymore. So, you know, that's one of those things <laughs> where it doesn't actually help. Uh, you know, it doesn't. You know, there's no pay to win concept behind being able to do. You know, all your mana in Tog or Paradise with a single click, or you know the you know, night striking or something like that. You know, you don't gain any significant advantage by being able to do that, but it allows the user, you know, to be able to log in from their phone at work, you know, wherever you might be, log in and perform these 20 operations from your phone in a single click and not have to wait for it to load, come back, lose reception, try this again, do that. I do so, genuinely hate sometimes when I hit the back button in my browser to submit an op again, and if it's too quick, I get an error message the second time. That infuriates me. Yep, exactly. So, you know, you'll be the perfect candidate for this uh, new gold status uh, uh, functionality. I, I'm already a premium member from the Swerve days. You mean to tell me <laughs> I don't I don't get this for free now? <laughs> no, you don't. See, that was called platinum, and this is uh, this is a gold status. So platinum's distinctly... above gold. Have you seen credit cards? Platinum's like maybe black is above platinum. I don't know, but there is not a single case where gold is above platinum, man. Well, in this case, it is. That's what makes Utopia <laughs> special. Uh, so you know, that's just one of the things. Um, you know, some other sort of fun functionality we thought we might want to implement is, you know, when you attack somebody, you know, wouldn't it be cool to be able to send them a customized message or even a little graphic or a picture for them to see in their news stream when they got attacked by you? Uh, just, a, you know, a little cool little functionality that, you know, you can use uh, just to add another fun element of you know uniqueness to the to your attacking and to the game. So I can add an avatar of me sticking my tongue out so that when I attack someone in their news feed, they get my face. That's correct. You could do that, I can... and that's exactly what it would be used for. There's going to be so much trolling so quickly. I, lo <laughs> I love it. That sounds great. Well, of course, you know, uh, you know, full disclaimer. <clears throat> Any of these things that would be submit would be would probably need to be approved first. It wouldn't be like a you know you're not going to be able to um, you know swear at people uh, you know do anything inappropriate. Bishop will strike you down. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, <laughs> ban hammer ready. So, um, but that was uh, you know one of the cool things we we thought people might enjoy or or like as part of the game, and some other cool things. You know that add to more of the you know gameplay functions is this idea of having email notifications, where uh, 
you know, you have in-game activity, you get attacked, you've got, you know, thief operations done on you. You know, if you're at work or whatever, this sort of hourly notification that if something happened to you, you know, you would get this email offer. Now, um, again, before people start to go crazy, the uh, idea behind this would be that the entire server would receive this sort of email notification availability. And uh, that would happen once per tick. If anything happened to you that tick, you'd get this notification. The uh, advantage you would receive from having a gold account would be that your email notifications would come much quicker, uh, as in five minutes or ten minutes or something like that. So, uh, again, it's it's not that you know pay-to-win mentality, but it offers you that you know bit of an advantage uh, where you don't have to wait till the end of the tick to really see something like that. Uh, a couple other things. I'll just, you know, I'll wrap up quickly. The uh, one, one, pretty fun idea we thought would be to remove all of the names of the scientists that are currently being generated, and drop that list down to, you know, zero, and allow these gold members to add <clears throat> names to the pool, you know, once a month. You, as a user, have the option, the ability to create a name for a scientist that will be generated, you know, for as long as scientists are being used. So Professor Goldie can get me 0.3% population <laughs> increase. That's correct. Oh, man. Goldie's already a scientist. Is Goldie already a scientist? Yeah, he, is, yeah. he, he is already a scientist, but he would be removed. <laughs> so somebody would need to actually uh, re-add him and uh, then you'd have to get him. Okay, so I've had a... Um... I've had an interesting question and a really good question, actually, from Noob Psych. And I'm going to ask you this question, but also improve on it, because I think there's a, a second layer to it that he hasn't asked, but I'm going to add. And I'm going to ask Bishop and Monk for their answers first. So his question is, if um, the multiple ops thing, if that's implementable and it's a clear feature that would help the game basically bring it closer to uh, the kind of features we'd expect from like mobile devices and stuff in 2017... Why not offer that feature to everyone rather than keep it behind a paywall? And I'm going to adjust that question uh, and suggest that does it? Um, I, there are there have been lots of games, and obviously uh, in my line of work, a lot of esports as well. So I'm talking about the League of Legends, uh, the Overwatches, uh, Counter Strikes with skins, all over the world, where games have found a lot of success using. I mean, this could be a subscription or it could be microtransactions or whatever, but for cosmetic items in the game. So the kind of stuff you were talking about where when I attack someone and my face appears in their newsfeed, like that counts as a cosmetic item. That's a lot of fun. Naming scientists, again, a really, really cool premium feature. But I would consider separating them from an actual feature that edited the way I play the game, like being able to do 20 tree of golds at once, for example, from my phone. Does it make sense, and I'm not asking you to commit to it, but is there an argument maybe for leaving anything that adjusts the way you play the game as a feature that's for everyone and anything that changes the game cosmetically as a feature for a gold tier or someone that pays for the game? Bishop, thoughts? Yeah, we'd actually thought about that. We thought about doing cosmetics that are just aesthetics. Um, but I guess uh, the take up on the aesthetic things take less. It's not that we want to build in features that are that are just so good that people have to pay for it. It's more that if we can build in features that are pre premium features that um, can be replicated in game by player actively playing the game, that it doesn't give you by pay money you get such a that can't be matched by another player. They're the sort of features that we're more interested in, that we think are good ones. Um, an example was like if you remember the old hostile meter where you could you could just replicate the hostile meter by going through your paper and counting but for a small nominal fee, like uh, a couple of credits, whatever it is, you can get it displayed in game. And that's that's the goal that we're going for. Like sure. We said we're okay, talking yeah. about automating spells and ops, like, but that doesn't mean do it in such a way that it's going to break the game. If we think that it'll give too distinctive an advantage or an advantage, we're going to think very carefully about it. How we... All right. Monk, anything to add to that? Yeah. Um, for me, it's also the, a key word is whether or not it's Thing. Sorry, you cut out for a few seconds there. Whether or not, <laughs> whether or not it's a convenience thing. So for me, the multiple spells and thieves are 
it's more a convenience thing and a lazy thing. Uh, as a player myself, I would probably be hesitant to using it always because sometimes, especially like for theory operations, you will want to adjust how many thieves you're sending. But using this multi thing, then you'll be sending whatever you specified to begin with, and <coughs> maybe an initial implementation. Okay. Uh, so this risk of oversending and suddenly fail the first five ones, then you you would have stopped normally, but you keep doing it, and that might then not be be optimal. It's also with other spells, you know, there's a risk that it actually you would have wanted to stop. But of course, you could also make the counter argument that some of them is also improving your abilities than uh, compared to a kingdom that hasn't paid for this. Um, and I think it's a it's a hard it's a hard balance, uh, and, and I appreciate some of the things are also. We want. Yeah, your your point was also that um, that some skins and those kind of things uh, should be payable. But on the other hand, as a developer myself, I would also like if something has been implemented in a way to look better. For example, if we spend time rewriting the sciences because it's kind of messy, uh, Monkbot fixes that slightly to try and bulk it up. But if, I would be annoyed as a user if it was a premium more decent than the other ways would. I think it's a it's a hard balance to strike this this concept of what can we actually expect people to pay for and what yep. should be common ground for everyone. I think um, while theoretically it's possible to get everyone online to do something at the same time, I think maybe a good litmus test for whether it would be a success or failure would be a situation where two kingdoms are at war. And for the sake of argument, one kingdom knows exactly when a critical attacker in their opposing kingdom is getting his army home, his or her army home. And the moment that army comes home, you have 12 people saying, I'm going to dump all my stealth into Night Strike literally like 20 seconds after the army's home. Like, to me, that's the kind of situation where a mechanic like, well, a convenience mechanic like this could be used to some sort of competitive advantage if someone can't get their army out again fast enough, for instance. I'm not saying there's like a right or wrong way to do it. I'm saying that that's the worst case scenario that I can think of in my head. And if the way something is implemented kind of like makes that not really much of a problem, then I don't really see any issue with it. But I can sort of see a few scenarios where organized kingdoms can use that to gain an advantage in the game. Yeah. Well, I think, you know, it's something you test and then you find out how to tweak it. Cool. And uh, in terms of new features rolling out soon, we've covered the gold status. Uh, did David mention refer a friend and activity bonuses? Or should we pass I did that not. over to... I, we're going to pass it over to Jeff. Jeff was basically so sick of hearing our voices that he disappeared for a little while. But he is back now to talk to us about refer a friend and in-game activity bonuses. Sure. Uh, refer a friend <laughs> is a bonus that existed back in the day. I don't know how many people played back in the ancient days of Swerve, but uh, once Woo! an age, um, once an age, you would be able to slash strongly encouraged to um, send invites out to five email addresses, and in exchange, you got fifteen acres. Um, our implementation will probably be something very similar to that. We haven't talked about final numbers and stuff like that, but same kind of thing where it's limited in gameplay impact. It's a small one-time thing, um, but that there are some sort of ongoing incentives. So, for example, um, if you refer the most players in a given age, we might let you name a scientist for the following age. Uh, with the understanding that we have veto power over offensive names and things like that. Um, I feel so, like Octo and Bart combined could probably triple the player pool for the right incentive pretty quickly. Uh, right, so the incentive would have to not be something you can take advantage of, right? Sure. Um, uh, and, and actually... Um, you know, you may even start seeing the refer stuff live. Um, I believe currently, if you go to your profile, um, you you do have, or maybe it's in the account settings. Um, your referral ID is is in place, but uh, you know, we'll we'll be rolling that out a, a little bit later. Um, 
And uh, the second thing was in-game activity bonuses. Um, you know, this is something that we've been talking about. And, and, and by the way, I, I see the, the chat going on on the side. Um, we'll be capping the amount of the bonus to be fairly small um, in terms of tangible things in-game. Sorry, Bart. Uh, yeah, so, so it's not <laughs> like you can invite 15,000 random people and gain 50,000 acres. Um, well, there goes my strategy. I might as well go home. <laughs> um, yeah, and we'll be watching Octo as well. And, <laughs> yeah. Um, and uh, so the end game activity bonuses that we're talking about are sort of the opposite of the old logout bonuses. Um, I love those, were... by the way, my 20 hour bonus making me active. What is this? Unbelievable. Uh, I know. Um, so, you know, it's something where there might be some kind of uh, bonus for hitting a certain number of um, uh, ticks logged in for 24 hours. So, flogger? For three days, and then he'll disappear for three weeks. But <laughs> yeah, for three say, days, for, he'll for three be that days. guy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay oh that's interesting well, i look forward to seeing um uh how that manifests itself that i think that's going to be difficult for any kingdom to maintain both in war and out of war you can argue that like 10 logins in 24 hours is a piece of cake for you know the top kingdoms especially when they're warring each other out of war doing it for three months straight oh man that's uh it's gonna be a little bit of a killer unless you know you um tap monk up to script something for you uh sec yeah well that's gonna be very interesting how that pans out obviously you'll have to word it and make sure it's done in such a way that you can avoid uh people taking advantage of it uh but i think i now want to move on to talking about the most interesting potential feature that everybody wants to talk about and what has effectively been a little bit of an elephant in the room since the beginning of the broadcast and I'm going to start with David, because in the forum post where you announced that this show was taking place, um, you dropped the word Genesis. Mm -hmm. And no one's allowed to drop the word Genesis without explaining themselves. And this is the part where we sit you in the corner and we force you to explain yourself. So go, go ahead and, and give us your thoughts. So we, we've been playing around with the term Genesis essentially since we took over and uh you know we've we've been pushing it off and pushing it off um genesis is really something that we want to do the right way and um our early expectations of putting out a genesis server were a little too ambitious um based on the complexity of of what it involves uh from a coding aspect and you know, Monk can, can share a little bit more about that if he wants to. But essentially, the previous guys, Sean and Brian, had coded the game to allow for this second server, you know, natively, you know, where everybody sees right now when you log in and you see age 72, um, the era of venerated bastions. Um, that is actually, you know, truly, you know, a lobby screen. Whereas if there were multiple game servers, you would have them all listed there. Uh, you just you know don't realize that because there's never been more than one, but uh, what I they had done was they. I remember when there were three. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so actually, back when there were three, you know, you had three separate accounts that you created to log into these three different yep. servers. So uh, essentially, what Sean and Brian did was they made one master account uh, that would hold all the achievements and all this stuff for all your different servers in this one account you know, through this lobby. And um, in order for us to really turn on another server that will interact the way it's meant to interact with all the different parts, the shop, the rankings, the servers, you know, all these things, it was uh, just too much for us to, to really wrap our heads around, deal with uh, the new age changes, do, you know, do all these things that were, that were coming up uh, and, and get Genesis done right. So, you know, we've pushed it off so that it, you know, gets done the right way and uh, implement, implemented in the way that, you know, everybody will be able to enjoy better. 
But uh, I mean, we we have plans, of course. You know, I'll tell you again, we have plans now. Hopefully, we can uh, get it, possibly see it rolled out within age seventy-two. Um, then I but, will get my Spartans as a race. Uh, it, Spartans as a race in yeah. the Genesis. Maybe, maybe maybe Spartan uh, is more like a personality. You know, you've got that. Uh, if you've had an honor crown, you're the best like player of all time instant and that's just like a inherent bonus from day one yeah so we would have to pull from our ranking i love server you really bart <laughs> <laughs> i'm in so much trouble now <laughs> but so i mean we do want to bring the genesis server um we really feel that it'll add a lot of uh a lot of benefit to the World of Legends server by having this this full uh, full on testing grounds for you know radical changes you know big new races um, you know these these big including big, dark elves yeah, dark elf freak <laughs> yeah so you know these types of things that we you know we can't test um, to the scale that really needs to be tested to implement uh, on the production server uh, you would see in the Genesis server and that's our goal. Okay, so um, I'm going to ask everyone an interesting question about Genesis. Obviously, there are people have to recognize, right, that when we do test all of these things on a server like Genesis, there are likely to be things that are overpowered, underpowered, game-changing in a way that we probably wouldn't have on World of Legends, right? But if you had one thing on your wish list that you would like to see on Genesis tomorrow, regardless of how it would impact the game... What would the first thing that came to your mind be off the top of your head, Monk? Poof. Um, yeah, right now, yeah. Um, so for me, as a people writing the chat, the concept of being forced to play with new people uh, or having the option to play with new people, I think that's the most exciting thing for me. And I'm not so interested in the gameplay. It's fun to do new gameplay. <laughs> But the fact that you play with new people that otherwise maybe normally are your enemies, so to speak, in the game, yep. uh, I think that uh, that can be quite fun. Bishop? I think I'd like to remove Fortified and War Stance. Just have like a debuff generator based. Kingdoms can just keep hitting each other. Not a War Stance, but uh, develop some sort of resistance to outside kingdoms. So you would still like keep fortified. you'd still keep the stances, but you would modify them and have them as debuffs rather than fortified or war. Yeah, have them dynamically generated rather than. Okay, Jeff. Um, you know, for for me, one of the most interesting things we're looking at on Genesis is testing out different kingdom sizes. Um, you know, I know there's been a lot of back and forth in the forums about you know, gee, should we go from 25 to 20 or 15. Um, and, you know, obviously that is a struggle to do on the main server or even to test on the main server, uh, you know, because you're breaking apart kingdoms that already exist. On Genesis, you know, where it's, you know, truly random and new, um, you know, there's really an opportunity to test smaller kingdom sizes and see what that does to gameplay. So, if you have 15 provinces instead of 25 provinces in a kingdom, how do you chain? Do you still chain? Does that change the ratio of attackers to these mages you run? Um, you know, all of these kinds of things are, are interesting things that you would have to try and solve with a randomly generated kingdom on Genesis, which creates a lot of opportunity for sort of fun, I think. Um, and uh, uh, yeah, so so I mean that's sort of the the concept that excites me the most about Genesis right now. Okay. As I start working on um, you know some of the the actual setup for it. And David, we'll finish with you. Oh, such a good question. Um, you know, I don't really I don't really have any one thing that I am really excited about with Genesis, aside from uh, you know just you know, the thing that, you know, Monk touched on, being able to, you know, experience the game with a bunch of new new people uh, all the time, not being able to invite people, um, you know, <coughs> playing with, uh, 
you know whatever whatever you have available to you that that that's probably one of the more uh more fun things about the old genesis that i remember is you know the meeting of people and um having to you know deal with that i i think for me it's a bit of a wishful thinking but i almost wonder if genesis can be um some sort of tournament server where you have a limited number of kingdoms with fewer people per kingdom and an age is like two or three weeks long and you're guaranteed to be uh in a kingdom with not another person who's in your kingdom in world of legends so it's completely random teams there's no chance there's anyone you currently play with and it's like a fight to the death over two or three weeks or something similar where you you have some ranking that's almost like a bit of a blitz by only concern about that is while it would be highly entertaining you'd also have a lot of people losing their jobs but i i feel like some sort of like hunger game style version of utopia could actually be a lot of fun all right so genesis potentially making an appearance while we're still in age 72 which could be very exciting uh, we're all looking forward to seeing how uh, that ends up panning out obviously you guys are going to be hard at work uh, putting that together amongst everything else you've spoken about today and uh, it has gone on a little bit longer than we anticipated but we're now going to open the floor to a couple of questions and i've been taking some questions from the forums also some from the chat i won't be able to take every single one but i will do my best to uh moderate and pick a couple and the first one i have is from battlefire 314 in chat um are you guys doing anything at the moment the answer is probably yes but i think the question is more how to get more new players into the game and do you have any statistics to share about the new players that have recently joined utopia Uh, I don't really think we have uh, done an analysis on the the new players. It can be seen pretty easily that you know there is a larger number of players at the start of this age than at the last age. Um, we've also seen, I mentioned in some forum posts, I think there were a considerable amount more uh, activity this out of protection than we saw last out of protection. I think it was somewhere around, um, you know, 15 to 20% more activity on the first few days right. um, out of protection. And, you know, Monk touched on that with part of uh, the oops talk. And, you know, we had this 20% more volume of activity and there was like 90% less oops that uh, up appeared. So yeah, can you know, we credit where it's due Monk? Um OOP was smooth as I think I had troubles logging into the site for a grand total of about two and a half minutes and then everything was fine. I'm used to being locked out for hours. It was quite pleasant this time around, to be honest. Uh, I mean, I, I was heavily monitoring at our protection. I mean, the site was slow. I mean, but the, the important thing was everything was being handled, but, you know, it did get queued up because there was sure. some massive... Uh, <laughs> load on the server but yeah it, it was nice to see things actually come through there are some issues where the game server works but it does a theory operation to get either the spy on the throne or military and then it passes that over to another page and during very extensive loads that transition can fail and so i think that was the main issue look, that you know, could be looked into fixing for another time is that many people did not get the results of what they were doing they were happening, sure. but for especially when getting intel that, you know, it becomes pointless to try and get it if you don't get any number. Yep, exactly. Sorry, David. Uh, we, we're yes. continuing the discussion there. Um, yeah, no, essentially we we didn't really, we haven't really done uh, much analysis on, on the new players joining, uh, retention and things of that nature. But, uh, you know, some of the things that we did do, we, we published that, uh, that guide that, you know, really brings that narrative to, you know, fantasy narrative back to Utopia that, you know, that's what got me to start playing back in the day. You know, you, you get involved in the game, the story, uh, in this fantasy world, and, you know, the the love for numbers and math and all that stuff. Um, it's only secondary to the, to the story of Utopia, right? I, I stare at spreadsheets all day in my day job. The last thing I want to do is come home and stare at more spreadsheets. So I, I totally yeah. hear you there. Yeah. Um, 
we have the next question I have for everybody. Um, I'll, I'll ask everyone for an opinion on this. Um, is one that a lot of people have been mentioning in passing. Uh, and I think it's no secret that if we compare Utopia now to, say, 30 ages ago, the player base is smaller than it was then. Although, anecdotally at least, it looks like, the, at least this age, um, th there has been some growth, and uh, hopefully we get to continue that upwards trajectory. But there's a discussion about kingdom sizes, and whether 25 provinces per kingdom is an appropriate number for World of Legends. Um, so I'll, I'll go ahead and respond to that first. You know, that's a, a tricky question. You know, it's, it's a hard thing to test because we don't want to break, break apart any existing kingdoms. And I think there's a lot of logic behind the theory that a lot of the, uh, time consuming stuff that relates to utopia is, um, uh, leadership effort more so than, you know, demand on player time. Yep. Um, and so it's, it's not something that we really are open to, to testing on the main server. Um, but as we look at Genesis, you know, like I said before, we are interested in testing the smaller kingdom size on Genesis. And it's possible that we learn something from Genesis that we bring back to the main server. Okay. Well, it'd be, um, it, I guess it'll be interesting to see what the uptake is on Genesis. If, if it turns out that there is a smaller size there and suddenly the player base triples, then that might tell us something. But we shouldn't jump ahead to conclusions, obviously. Uh, David, did you have anything to add to that? No. Nope. Cool. All right. So um, let me take a look. I have another game from A13. I'm going to call you A13 because that's just a difficult name to pronounce but sensible in Twitch. In the future... Is there any consideration, and Monk, this might be one for you mainly, is there any consideration to removing the tick from the game? Now, I for one remember the swerve days where ticks were instantaneous, at least, or near instantaneous for a little bit. But obviously, a lot of us understand that that kind of mechanic is sort of necessary for the game to run. And at some point, possibly when uh, o Omac Jolt took over, uh, the the tick was changed to what we know it as now, where it did actually take a full 20 to 30 seconds per hour for the game to tick over. Can you give us some insight into what it looked like before and why it looks like what it does now and whether it's going to change in the future? Yeah. So, I mean, I can mainly speak to why, how it looks today. Uh, accessible to me. I think, I mean, the main... The main reason it's how it is today is because it is extensive to do the ticking and you want to get it right. You don't want people to miss. You don't want some to have ticked and others to have not. So I think the idea from Sean and Brian when they did it was to really to condense it and to have full control over it and not have odd things happen mm. uh, in the meanwhile. Um, and I think that makes sense. I think uh, potentially some things can be optimized. <coughs> um, and maybe some other things can't. Um, so, so for me, and I know it is something we internally have spoken about, is can we then use the tick in a more uh, useful fashion? I mean, the, the issue now is that people are kicked out of the game completely when it ticks. And that's, I think, one of the biggest frustrations. If you were instead shown your own throne with like a tick a counter down or shown other kind of content at the time, probably that would uh, lessen most of the frustration. Or if you were just able to see Kingdom pages at your own, but weren't able to do anything, um, a lot of the frustration of it taking a tick could maybe be handled. Um, yeah, so the, the, the answer is that it, there's a lot. Of it's nice to have it uh, under control, condensed into one thing happen, uh, it happening. Because potentially otherwise, if you allow other things to happen at the same time, then it just takes too long to get through everyone. And then you have all awesome cases where some have taken, some others haven't. Okay. Um, That's the way it used to be under Mail, so it did the old days. And yep. like a lake. So not every province is. I don't know if you remember, it used to have. Sorry, uh, can you lean in a bit, Bishop? You're cutting out every couple of words. Yeah. Do you remember back in the old days um, on the ticks, um, you used to have to manually update the provinces yourself if you were going to wave them to see what size the land or the network was? Yes, exactly. Update net worth and stuff like what that. What did we do? Did we send a message or something like that? Or did we... 
Uh, I, I used to send yeah, messages. Yeah, you had to send a message. Yeah. And then the game used to go down about, it was like 10 a.m. Um, Euro time. Down for a few minutes while he kind of did, a, did database maintenance. That's, oh, right. that's the difference between the, the old tick and the new tick. I see. So the old tick, well, appearing to us as something that's faster, um, obviously behind the scenes, it led to potentially all sorts of yeah. chaos. Yeah, it actually didn't tick for a lot of problems. Well. Right. And, and actually, the example that I would use mm. is because it's uh, a lazy tick, which, which is to say your province never updated unless you were logged in. There were examples where you would attack someone, get meteor showers cast on you, your troops get home, you log in, and you have 12 ticks of meteor showers on your offense. Yeah. Rough. Because the game didn't know your troops were out for the last 12 hours when it actually ticked the meteor showers. Yep. So obviously the, the, the current way the game is designed makes sure that we alleviate these things. And more importantly, means that there aren't massive problems that we need to then go back and fix retrospectively. Which, to be fair, there was a bit of in the Swerve days. So oh, fair enough and thank you for the answers, everyone. Um, the a really good question and one that uh, several people in the chat have also mentioned as well, coming from Warcry Nuck here. Uh, what's the idea? Well, I can kind of guess the idea, but is there any development on the idea for a universal utopia application? And what is planned for the pipeline in the near future? I have no idea who's going to answer this one, by the way. Uh, when we talk about a utopia application, are we referring to a phone <laughs> application? Is that... We are indeed. Um... So at the moment, um, there's obviously the unofficial app, and you know we work with Josh to support him on the unofficial app. Um, that's that's sort of what we're what we're doing there at the moment. Um, we would like to have an official app, uh, but it's not something that is on the immediate short-term agenda. Okay. Yeah, I mean, uh, if I can weigh in. Um... I mean, in the end, we have limited time at our disposal for for it to, to implement different things. And I think, at least as me as a developer, um, it would take considerable amount of time to actually develop a really good app. Uh, and that time could be put perhaps instead of just updating the, the web UI to be more up to date. And maybe that would solve a lot of the issue or create other kind of functionality that people actually would more enjoy and it's this fine balance of the amount of hours we have at our disposal to actually do new stuff for the game how do we use them in the best possible way where i think while we all really want a really good app it's hard to really justify spending 100 hours on that instead of creating cool new features or of improving course, yeah. the, the ui in general uh, in the browser and primarily if we do <coughs> update the browser interface to be more modern and actually response to being used in a, on a mobile device. I think a lot of the argument of the need of a mobile uh, app kind of falls away. Uh, a little bit of a follow-up question to that. Um, do you think that given a reasonable number of the community are, for lack of a better, all-encompassing description, nerds, that we have a reasonable number of developers out there who might be able to lend a hand? I mean, I admittedly, Josh commitment. is one of them, to be fair. So I think it's hard to get people to come. I mean, uh, I also, as a monk, but a little bit here, a little bit there. But the issue with these kind of projects is that you really need people to invest a lot and also to be sure that they, they're in it for the long haul. <clears throat> um, so, yeah, it's kind of hard. We kind of tried it out with this idea of having some coders being able to implement a way to use the, the kingdom dog to make a target finder. Uh, and I, we've had less yeah, that's a great point. entries than uh, I kind of expected with, as you say, the, the use base being quite tech um, <coughs> adept. But even though we still didn't get as many as I... I... That's a really good point, actually. Did you, uh, did you guys find what you were looking for out of the competition to do the target finder? Um, while there were fewer entries than you expected, were the quality of entries such that you were like, oh, this is great. We've managed to shorten some dev time on the game itself. We can implement a new feature, and this is awesome. So on a scale of that to, oh, this was actually, we can't really use this. It's a little bit rubbish. Where, where does it kind of sit? What were the results from that? I think shortly put, we've gotten some really cool ideas that we ourselves, 
But on the technical implementation, I think one thing is we lack a clear explanation of what we needed. Um, and then we just haven't gotten that. Uh, so, I mean, I, I'm saying we didn't get the technical that we probably wanted, but it, it, that might partly fall upon ourselves in not explaining it more specifically what it is we need. That's really good, though, because that gives you an iterative process where you can actually go back to the community next time and say, OK, guys, now we know exactly what we want. Here's a better brief. Um, and they, it gives you a nice platform and good experience to be able to do this better. Sure. Cool. All right. Let's uh, let's move on to another question. Um, by the way, for anyone in chat who's tuned in late and is desperate to ask us about Dark Elves, we've covered Dark Elves. Uh, I saw that at least once more in chat. I'm like, no, 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 we've got that. Um, I'd love to uh, have a top line overview on what everyone's thoughts are behind the switching from the science system from books to scientists and what you think the pros and cons of the system has been. Um, Bishop, I'm tempted to start with you uh, from a player's perspective yeah. and, uh, and how you feel that's gone. And if you can pinpoint, because obviously I can think of quite a few areas where I think it's a lot better, but if you can pinpoint one area where you think the system is weak, I'd be interested to hear it. Yeah, so I we made the change to scientist spawning. Two reasons. Um, one, we wanted to cap tight, um, and the reason was because we, the second reason was we wanted to kind of eliminate the pumping that's required with science. Like basically, whichever kingdom got big first could pump science harder and longer, and they get such an advantage that nobody else could catch up. So that's why science was changed. Right. Um, another reason it was changed was because it changed. We felt good with, so we just did it. You know, it's all about changing from. So, out, like, sorry, you, you cut out for a bit there. It, it, I heard it was all about changing, and then everything cut out. Uh, no, we wanted to change um, because utopia is all about changing stuff. You know, every month or every age functions, doing things. So we wanted to change science. Um, Fair. One thing okay. that didn't work well uh, that I alluded to earlier on was that people couldn't predict when the scientists were going to spawn. So that led them to areas where they had no science to spawn and they didn't like that experience. It's not, it's not very positive when you build a load of science, um, laboratories and don't get some. Yeah. So I like the change they've done. I just assumed it was you trolling me at some point where I got my 20% <laughs> labs in and then nothing spawned in 20 hours and I'm like someone yeah, up there okay. it is, is yeah, hating it's, me. It's not nice. People, people don't enjoy it. It does balance out over the course of like, you know, as, as the time period gets longer, it balances out. But when you see that like the, the <clears throat> negative area where nothing is wrong, it's, people don't like it. It's unpleasant. Not fun. Dave, Jeff? Yeah, I um, was not a big fan of the random number generated uh, scientists. I was pushing for, you know, a you know, set amount of generation like we have now uh, since the beginning so uh i'm much in favor of you know the system we have now as opposed to the uh rng that we had before um you know just it didn't make sense to you know penalize people for just being unlucky or rewarding people for being very lucky it just you know that's not what utopia is to me um utopia for me is you know calculated uh, if i want to do this you know this is how i can get there and, and that's what you know, utopia was for me. So, you know, to, to remove a, an entire aspect of the game from having that ability, uh, it just, you know, it didn't make sense. So um, I really have in place now. Uh, I, I'm not sure I'm a fan of it over the book system. You know, you, you lose that whole aspect of what do I do with my gold now? Um, you know, how am I supposed to get an advantage over somebody else uh, by running a better province, um, you know, you kind of lose that. But, you know, we'll see if there's some things that we have planned for down the line to, you know, bring in another element, you know, similar to that in the future. Yeah, I think that, I, I personally think that makes a lot of sense, especially when you consider the removal of books effectively removing pumping, um, which was, to be honest, broadly successful. So, Jeff, do you have anything to add to that? Uh, yeah, so um, I, I think a lot of what I have to say is similar to the kinds of stuff that Dave was talking about. You know, 
for me, one of the issues was there was a big snowballing effect on science where once you got ahead, you were always ahead, um, particularly at the top. Um, and, and so some kind of cap was necessary to prevent the effect of science bonuses sort of snowballing and getting insane by, you know, mid age for a top portion of, of the server. Um, you know, that said, the issue with the system now is that there's just very little to do with gold. Um, and because there is so little to do with gold, you know, you wind up with big provinces just stacking insane amounts of gold and not having anything to do with them. And then, you know, being able to pump incredibly deep, not that they couldn't to some extent before as well, sure. but just that the, the lack of anything that requires you that requires you to really have gold um, means that there is less demand for you to you know have peasants at all times or whatever else. Um, so you know it's it's kind of a, a you know that's that's sort of the the duality we see. We we like some of the elements of it, but we miss some of the things that books let you do by giving you some sort of continual investment that you could see a growing benefit over time, you know, and, and then of course the, the remaining element is sort of that question of, you know, does it matter if, uh, you know, bonuses go up when you get chained and, you know, what does that mean, uh, you know, for, for provinces that are, are fighting, um, you know, that you don't have a, a huge housing bump when you go from, you know, 5,000 acres to 500 acres. Um, you know, and, and so it's it's just something that, you know, re requires a bit of thinking. Um, and, and then, you know, sort of last comment is obviously um, while the user experience portion of um, scientists is perhaps reminiscent of old utopia and that it's not great, um, it's also just not great. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and, you know, there has to be a better way of managing it than this huge list of names you have to go through and like find the one you're looking for and change it. You've just reminded me to log in and cast Revelation, and I logged in and I'm starving. I probably shouldn't admit that on Twitch, but <laughs> oops. I'd suggest you start with Fertile Lands then. I'm, uh, I'm channeling my inner flogger is what's happening here. All right, guys, we're, we're pushing on to two hours. So uh, let's go ahead and wrap things up with a couple more questions. Um, let me see. Let's take a look at one from, maybe one from the dock. Hang on a sec. All right, so um, how, oh, this is interesting. Are player, well, I know the answer to this, but it's interesting that it's enough people have asked it that it's made it onto the list. Are players that pay for credits treated differently? No, simple answer. Um, people feel like they might deserve special treatment because they, you know, buy credits, they do this and that. The simple answer is that everybody is treated uh, fairly and on the same grounds as everybody else, regardless of whether or not they have uh, purchased credits in the past or continue to pur purchase credits or anything like that. It's just... <laughs> so, someone from the kingdom's obviously watching because I just got sent a lot of food before the tick. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so bad. That, I, I think it's an important distinction to make. Like people who I, I obviously I got ad block on the game, possibly at the earliest possible opportunity in the swerve days, and I still donate and buy credits and do various things um, regularly to try and uh, do my bit to support the game. But who do you donate to? Beg your pardon. <laughs> Not, Who do you donate to? Not, yeah. not you, mate, if that's what you mean. Oh, okay. Uh, <laughs> I donate acres, mainly. Okay. But uh, when I can, I do. Uh, I support the credit system, um, and I support the development of the game. And I think it's important, just like when you're donating to anything that you feel strongly about, that there isn't really any expectation except the excitement that comes with being a part of the community. Um, so it's, it's, it's good to hear that it, to me, it was partially worrying to hear the number of people that actually brought that up because it is an important issue to address. And it's important. Uh, we kind of touched on it earlier with some of the new features that utopia isn't pay to win. It straight up isn't. Yeah. So, uh, it's, it's good to have that reinforcement 
and at the same time this is like one of the oldest gaming communities on the internet right so it's worth yeah. supporting but so uh a point yeah um i mean i just also want to point out that and uh, so if people want our attention and help you know it, it's often easier to give it when people speak in a nice and civilized way at least that's my, my on the take internet on are you <laughs> kidding <laughs> on running monk but that uh, it, it's just a much more pleasant experience to helping people that that are pleasant to speak with so i mean it, people can forget about it but we are running a game with a lot of users and uh, and uh, at least from my perspective it's much more pleasant to speak pleasantly with other people always a fair point David, you had something else? Uh, yeah, we had just brought up the uh, ad blocking and, you know, your legacy ad blocking. Um, you know, th that that's one of the things we wanted to add to the um, premium, the gold status, was that uh, permanent ad block to your account so that, you know, it's, it's not only, you know, giving you these, you know, cosmetic changes and, you know, whatever else it might do, uh, it'll basically be supporting the game. Uh, through that, you know, ad blocking software. All right. Well, in the interests of time, I think we have a maximum of one more question. And conveniently, there are two more questions in the doc, one of which we've covered already. So um, this is a bit of a broad question, but there might be a short conceptual answer. Why, the, why are we now thinking about putting our emphasis on war and growth from war? For example... Uh, having the opportunity for kingdoms to win the honor crown by winning the most wars, for instance. Does this have any negative consequences for kingdoms that are playing for growth and really just trying to win in the net worth and land charts? Do you see that as being detrimental to one group of users or the other? That's something that, that I that I talked about before, was that we try to balance the bonuses and the, the effects that you get from warring with people that don't war. So we don't want to make we want there to be multiple paths to success, and um, so trying to get the balance right between you know, you know whoring for land or staying outside and pumping, going into war and possibly getting there, getting chained down to not the other person having to cover. We want to provide tools for people to allow them to, to get on well after war. Yep. But at the same, time, don't penalise people. Yeah, no, that makes sense. Um, anything else to add? Cool. Well, during the duration of our first broadcast, Affairs of the State, um, again, any suggestions for renaming? Please uh, stick them on a postcard. I preferred Behead This Advisor, but got vetoed down. Um, broadly in chat, chat's been broadly well behaved. Um, I think there's wide consensus that Bishop is stunningly good looking, but somehow Monk's the only one that got a marriage proposal. So I don't really know how to um how to sort of divvy up the credits there but I, I think it just remains for me to say it's been really quite fun i've actually learned a lot about the game and the history of the game even though the transition uh to new ownership has taken place rather recently it's been a lot of fun hanging out with you guys and i think the people in chat and hopefully the people on the forums and elsewhere that might not normally tune in but did tonight uh got a lot out of the broadcast i know we originally said it would last about an hour it's lasted two so I really appreciate you guys hanging around. Um, in turn, I think it makes sense for all of you, like if we maybe end with some closing words and uh, maybe some some stuff that you're looking forward to talking about next time, for instance. So David, how about we start with you? Uh, okay, well, uh, I would definitely like to do this some more. Uh, the whole idea is to just, you know, give people an opportunity to see us, talk to us, interact with us, and, you know, really see that your um, ideas, thoughts, suggestions are getting heard and, you know, seeing direct feedback. Um, so I'm excited. Jeff? Um, yeah, you know, I, uh, I, well, I would hope for the next one for us to be able to talk a little bit more specifically about, you know, plans for Genesis. Oh, we could have like a, 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 a Genesis specific episode talking about all things that are about to break the game in so many ways you can't even count them. Uh, and Bishop? Yeah, I'd like to see more of the posters, uh, uh, more of the players posting on the forums because we do read the forums a lot, but I certainly read all the suggestions. So um, the more the more you guys interact with us, uh, hopefully the better things will be for everyone. 
a lot of right. suggestions for the players, so we'd like to keep that going. And last but not least, Monk, you also have the opportunity to respond to your marriage proposal. <laughs> well, sadly, I'm already married and occupied, so I can't, I can't do much about that. Um, I would say that my my main interest, in what differs from the others, is that uh, well, I have a, you could say, a wet dream about being able to integrate a lot about the what Monkbot is natively to the game. Uh, so that would be something to talk about another time because there's a lot of issues there um, or also considerations. But um, to be able to give everyone the features that Monkbot is in a native fashion is something I'd look into. And then also to bring some kind of global chat into the game much more natively because one of the things I think uh, is happening these days is that everyone is decentralizing talking known groups and we need a, a place where everyone in the easy fashion can can chat and talk to each other all right well thank you everybody uh for your time today there are just in the last two minutes we've already gathered enough topics to talk for at least two or three more episodes um i hope everyone watching has enjoyed the show as well if you have make sure to go ahead and post on the forums and let us know you can um I, i'm at jorasar on twitter but more importantly you want to go to the utopia forums at utopia-game.com post on the forums there let us know what your feedback looks like and uh, we will incorporate as much of that as possible into future editions of the show we hope to make this a regular thing and we hope you guys have enjoyed watching but from all of us here at utopia game uh, that is us signing out for this evening we'll see you for the next episode later take care